is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Some Spoiled, the co-host switcheroo, the rereading Return to Westeros, HBO spoiler edition, un- uncensored, too hot for TV, bringing you the greatest hits from 1996. Call in with your request now. In these chapters, <laughs> we have Eddard, and uh, he's just really just right up until the end. He really thinks he's got this under control, and it would be almost precious if it wasn't so pathetic. And then there's Arya, who honestly has her shit more under control than her fucking full-grown father does. And I respect that. Welcome to Some Spoiled. Fuck the king. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. I'm Rashawn. Apologies for cracking my knuckles right up in the mic like that at the start of the show, everyone. I'm sorry. So, all right, Rashawn, we're doing two chapters. Um, The next chapter, I don't know if you saw, after Arya is Sansa. So we're going to be seeing a very different perspective on what is happening from each of their Mm. viewpoints. Um, But what... What did you think about reading this? Does it feel about the same as the show? Um, <clears throat> it does. I, I, um, I'll say while I was reading it, it. Oh my God, you guys, Ned Stark. Yeah. I think when I was watching this, because I had no idea what was happening, I was still under the impression. I think that the big noble hero was going to come into town and uh, prevail, you know, over these morally bankrupt, sinister characters. Okay. So when he goes marching into the throne room with his little note, you feel kind of like, oh, you know, it's about to be something. Mm Mm-hmm. Even though, as you're watching the show, you see, like, you have the information you need to know that this isn't going the way you think it's going to go. Right. But somehow, I guess, because we're just so used to these stories being told in such a way, that as you're watching, for me anyway, you just kind of ignore all the signs that say this is not going to work out. Yep. Yep. That was my experience the first time reading this, that I was just like, well, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see who saves him. I'm really <laughs> eager and excited to see how he gets out of this one. Mm-hmm. Reading it, I am just disgusted. <laughs> I'm so irritated. I posted earlier that, you know, him walking into this throne room with this note. It's just like big DNC energy. Yeah. It's just, you know, she rips his little note up and is like, we got a new king now. <laughs> and he's got no plan B. Nothing. Nothing. I My favorite part is when uh, he's asking for Renly and they're like, Renly, <laughs> Renly been gone. <laughs> he left you. And yeah. he's like, what? I was counting on his support. And I'm like, man, this is, look. <sighs> he told you. He really told, told you, you. Gave you a chance to get his support. You poo-pooed in his face. That sounds really gross. Why did Let you me have to do it that. like that? Didn't, didn't mean for it to come out like that. I apologize. Oh, God. <laughs> but he... <laughs> But, you know, he was all, he was too good for Renly, Mm -hmm. right? So, Renly bounced under cover of darkness, which is really the thing that needed to be done, quite frankly. And not much different from what 
Ned was planning on doing him his damn self. Yeah. You know? He uh, was planning on putting his daughters on the fucking ship to get them out of town, get Stannis to come so that he could bounce, too. Yeah. And Renly was just like, I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. Way ahead of you, buddy. <laughs> and Ned is caught so flat-footed. First of all, this has all happened faster than he thought it would. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, what the, the chapter starts with um, him waking up to a lot of, like, goings-on down in the courtyard or whatever. Yeah. You know, the guards and... Uh, Hounds and everybody's making a big ruckus and a big kind of show of might. And he wonders, Ned wonders, like, are they doing this for me? Mm -hmm. And I kind of think they are. I think so. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, the the day starts, he goes to have breakfast with the girls, and uh, Sansa is still devastated that she's, you know, being taken home and not allowed to go see Joffrey to say goodbye, and she's beside herself about that. Yeah. And um, then he finds out uh, who comes by. Pycelle comes by and gives him the news that Robert has passed away. Right. And that's when shit gets real. Yeah, so, first of all, well, you know what, I'm not going to say that. Um, mm-hmm. There's a thing that I'm like, I'm, I can't decide if I'm spoiling you or not, so I'm just going to leave it. But, um, Pycelle showing up and telling him Robert's dead. Can I be honest with y'all? I had thought Robert died last chapter. I forgot that he just goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he just like falls into a sleep that's un you know unsteady or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I really was like, well, Robert's dead. All right, Ned chapter. What's he gonna do now that Robert's dead? And then somebody comes in and is like, hey, Robert's dead. I'm like, bitch, we know. Oh wait, we didn't know. My bad. You know. So my bad. Uh, moving on. And it feels like it's only been. It's only been one night because uh, when this chapter opens, it says that he had like a a brief exhausted sleep. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming this is just like the next day. Yeah, I think so. He has uh, seen Robert at his bedside and gotten the little decree that he's going to be protector of the realm and all that stuff. So Pycelle comes in, tells him that Robert's died. And Ned is like, all right, bet. Get the small council together. Bring them up to me mm-hmm. because my legs all fucked up. But really bring them up to me because this is the only place I feel safe. Yep. I'm not going down to the small council room because I don't know those. I don't know them like that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And. Uh, he sits there like Bernie with his mittens on. Oh, my God. <laughs> Listen, I had to. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm moving on. <laughs> moving on. Yeah, I'm not even. Not even going to get into that. So, um, this is when he finds out that Renly is gone. And his shock tells, is so funny. My man. God, he gone. He left the city. Doesn't he think I, I, he didn't like the smell of that? Something like that? Yes. Dude, yes. I don't know how to tell you this, but mm. your nose has been broken. Because you shouldn't have liked the smell from... A, a week any back. of this you know it's this. just it's he's only smelling shit when it's people on his own side but his actual enemies and he's just fucking nose dead is that what you call it i feel like it's I, like, I, probably I, what you call it i uh okay yeah nose dead <laughs> so you call it because like if you have if you can't hear deaf if you can't see blind if you can't smell what's that uh, I feel like I've heard it called nose blind, but that sounds terrible. That feels like nonsense. <laughs> That's no better than nose dead, as far as I am concerned. Are you hard of smelling? I mean, a little, right? Like, all right, Google, what is it called when you can't That's smell? That's a Seinfeld joke with the with the car with the bo. And he's like, do you smell that? And she's like, of course I smell it. What am I, heart is smelling? Hypos- hyposmia 
is a reduced ability to detect odors. Nobody calls it that. Anosmia is the complete inability to detect odors. In some cases, someone may be born without a sense of smell, a condition called congenital anosmia. Anosmia. Oh my god, anosmia. Come on, <coughs> nose dead. <coughs> Y'all are trying to dress it up like yours makes more sense than mine. Did you Google nose dead? I did not. <laughs> I don't want to because I don't know what Rule 34 is going to apply to that. So, um, oh. All right, so he... Basically, the the point of getting them all up here is to be like, see this piece of paper? The seal's not broken. Do you all agree? This is the paper that he gave me. You guys saw me come out with it. It's got a seal mm-hmm. on it. This is like, mm-hmm. this is it. And My doctor said, I don't have to go to gym for the next oh three God. weeks. <laughs> so you had been very concerned about the fact that there were no witnesses to Robert's words, but it looks like even if there had been, it would not have mattered at all. Right. Um, what good are these guys, honestly? I mean, at least... I don't fucking know, guys. I was really irritated that all this happened with no witnesses. Having witnesses to the letter didn't end up meaning shit. Uh, the letter itself didn't end up meaning shit. Get close to your mic for me. But, um... That's weird. Um, so... Once we see Cersei tear that letter up, that that kind of just shoots my whole uh, irritation about not having witnesses right to, right down the crap. Yeah. But part of me also is like, well, maybe if there had been witnesses, um, and and not just having the witnesses, but Ned would have had to have been willing to do some shit he clearly unwilling to do Mm. which is um take people up on their offers like Ridley you know um to strengthen his position so now like like he's got say three people in the room with him with Robert they all hear Robert say that he you know Ned should be protector of the realm this is how it's gonna go and Hopefully, the people that are witnesses will think that, well, Ned's going to be a person in power. So, I, you know, it would make sense for me to support him in that endeavor. Um, but since he doesn't, doesn't seem to be capable or willing to make any of those kind of alliances, mm. except for the weird, the weird business with Peter, which we talked about last episode. Right. Um. Ultimately, yeah, it doesn't matter if he has witnesses or not because he goes in empty-handed. He goes in with just the note and they all turned his back on him. Yep. So now I'm just like, maybe it doesn't matter because as long as it's Ned. (laughs) You know, like maybe maybe having witnesses would have meant something if it had been someone that wasn't Ned Stark. That's cold blooded. I think that's what it ends up being. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, like um, when even with when I was like so focused on it, I was operating as if we were talking about somebody with some goddamn sense. Mm-hmm. You know, who understood what was happening, what the stakes were, and how to play this game. Even though he has shown me repeatedly, he is none of those things. Yeah. So, really, that's my bad. (laughs) (laughs) I just... It it just keeps coming down to him not wanting to get his hands dirty in certain ways because he thinks he's above it. And Mm -hmm. it's just the same... I'm not doing it. But you guys know. And there is, I I understand that sort of idealism, but you have an actual world that you have to move through and live in and accomplish things in. And I, I want to know how much pride is worth to you. And I would venture a guess if somebody asked him 
what his pride was worth. Was it? Be, would it be worth his daughter being forced to marry a fucking sadistic lunatic? Would it be his daughter having to go out on the run in the midst of like a war ravaged countryside, mm-hmm. and his sons being abandoned in Winterfell? Would he have been like, yeah, that's worth it for my honor? I feel right. like no. No, but I feel like no, too. I don't know, because he's such a fucking thick-headed, stubborn mule about shit that I don't... I'm not entirely confident on that. He he has a brief moment when he's talking to Cersei about uh, what she... The length she's willing to go to protect her family and her loved ones. Mm-hmm. And he thinks to himself, what would he do for his children? You know, would he do as much? And he kind of says, you know... Basically, yes. Yeah. So I think that he, like, to, like if it came down, like, is your pride worth what, what it has cost you? You know, I think that he would 100% be like, no. But I don't know if I think we can chalk up everything about him to just pride, these poor decisions that he's making. It's, it's, it's like, it is pride, right? It's principle, um, which... Principle is like a weird thing, right? Like it's noble, mm-hmm. you know, it's good to have it. We generally applaud it and uh, we're always holding people in high esteem that we feel like are really living by their principles. But at the same time, they can handcuff you. And it's a really weird thing to say because... Uh, <laughs> It's not that I want people to just be like wishy-washy, right? Or to go back on their word or not stand for anything. Like, obviously, that's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. However, I think that it's fair to interrogate what you believe and why you believe it. Yes. All the time. To always come back to reevaluating, you know, why you hold certain things so high and other things so low. Mm-hmm. And for Ned, he is holding certain sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call, what, what the fuck? Certain like cultural mores, right? He's, he's holding these like supposed rules up mm-hmm. when literally no one else around him is. Right. And that makes him, uh, I guess morally righteous because he's the one, you know, still holding up these truths and mm-hmm. holding up to these like lofty ideas. But literally no one else is. So what are you doing? Yeah. Like how, who and how is it helping? Um, what, what are you gaining? What's the benefit? Like, like to be, Walking around saying you're the most righteous person in the room doesn't mean anything if it's not in service of something or in benefit of someone. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I mean when I am saying, like, what's your pride worth? Because it feels like he thinks he's accomplishing something here. And it's interesting because, like, I don't – I feel like he could have had he approached this differently. Obviously – his concerns that he has had about the Lannisters and their influence have turned out to be valid. His mm-hmm. feelings that Joffrey is like a bad fucking seed. We know that's true. Mm-hmm. And so his being like, I want to save this, like, I want to keep this madman from becoming king. And this just turned out kind of, it, it feels almost like convenient that Joffrey isn't Robert's son because he couldn't really wrap his head around this kid marrying his daughter and being about to like run things. So I think he can tell himself about how I'm doing this for the good of everyone because he can't sit the throne and this wouldn't be fair or right. And it would, you know, result in people being harmed, but he's not willing to, compromise himself in order to accomplish that in any way. So it doesn't feel like it could possibly be that urgent to you. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. it's just, 
it's something that you would like in a perfect world for this to work out. And guess what? You know, the, the fact that not only Renly, but also Littlefinger came to you with alternative ways to handle this means that everybody that you have spoken to, just that you've spoken to, sees the writing on the wall here. Mm-hmm. Everybody mm-hmm. else is already making their own plans, and you haven't taken that into account at all. And just how how much of a child are you? The the moment in the throne room, right when um, after the big confrontation where he tries to present his little letter, uh, he actually hands it over to Cersei. Like she's just mm. going to be like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I'm reading Jeffrey, it. Thank you, know. you. I need my glasses. Right, Joffrey, get up, get out the chair. Ned, come sit down. Uh, and that he then commands the guard to take Cersei and Joffrey into custody. Yep. And he thinks that this is a winning strategy. He really thinks the, that the gold cloaks are on his side still. It, like this idea that, and and from his perspective, they should be because he's the hand of the king mm-hmm. and he's the rightful you know, person to, to be on a throne next and, uh, you know, until Jeffrey comes of age and, and the, the, what are they? The gold cloaks Mm -hmm. are, uh, loyal to the throne. Right. Right. Not necessarily the sitting king, whoever has the power, you know, the right to be on a throne is who commands them. As far as that's concerned, Mm -hmm. it's him. Mm -hmm. He's got the letter. He's got the letter in his hand. And he just does not seem to understand that nobody gives a fuck about that letter. Mm-hmm. And that, she, that he caused them, caused them to arrest, well, not arrest, but take them into custody after she has ripped this letter up to me is just like, you know, you just want to throw your hands in the air and just like, oh, come on. <laughs> and, um, who is it that gets all outraged? Is it, is it Salmi? Barrison, yeah. Which, he's like, those are the words of the king. <laughs> yep. There goes another one that's not seeing the writing on the wall. And I think that there's just... Uh, I keep coming back to the idea of, of the cost of this, right? What all of this costs Ned Stark. Mm-hmm. And it cost him... Everything up to and including his head, his literal head. Yep. And it is a really sad, um, a really sad indictment of what that kind of rigid, you know, Mm. rigidity in, in itself, Yeah, you know, what that can mean and the consequences of that. Of uh, not being able to, there's this great this great bit in the next chapter with Aria and um, Silvio, Sirio, Sirio Pharrell, and he's talking to her about the importance of being able to see what's right in fucking front of you. Mm-hmm. And I just was like, why are you not giving this talk to Ned Stark? Honestly. <laughs> It's, it, what, it's the, so good. the way it happens is that they're fighting and he's like telling her which way he's going to go so that she can block him. And he tells her he's about to go left and she goes to block left and instead he goes right. And she said, and he's like, ha, you're dead now. And she says, but you cheated mm-hmm. and you told me you were going left. And he said, my words said left. My mm-hmm. whole fucking body said mm-hmm. right. You've got to learn to look with your eyes. Oh, it's so good. And it's just really like that is exactly Ned's fucking problem. He mm. is not looking with his eyes. Nope. He, nope. He's people are telling him left and he's like, left it is. Mm-hmm. Kid, wake up. Yeah. I love. uh it's so funny. We've been like, you know, dragging Ned so much throughout this because he deserves it. He does, though. But the next chapter with Arya, how quickly she assesses what the fuck is going on around her, mm-hmm. how quickly she adapts, you know, it's just like night and fucking day. Yeah. 
Um, and Ned is a I lot like really... Sansa now that I think about it. Listen, he lives. His, he's living a life like he's in a, one of her fucking songs mm-hmm. that she loves so much. You know, like instead of giving uh, Sansa that lecture, how should have fucking stopped by Ned's apartment? Yeah. Um. And it just, it's just, it's such a, uh, it's such a difference. I really like that connection too, about how similar Sansa and uh, Ned are when it comes to their expectation of what other people are going to do Mm -hmm. and, and say and mean, you know, even when people are lying to Ned and he has a feeling that they're lying, he still doesn't seem like, like, he'll be like, I don't trust that Ferris guy to himself. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but but his actions don't really reflect that, mm-hmm. that he has any real distrust of any of these fucking people. Because that would be impolite, like, like, and we can't have that. Listen, got to be civil. If you're not civil, all is lost. All is lost. Um. But also, <laughs> fuck your feelings. <laughs> so, yeah, it just, uh, so... So they're in the throne room, and and she's getting heated, and Ned just comes out and says, Joffrey is not a true heir to the throne. He doesn't say who his dad actually is, Mm -mm. which I thought was interesting. I didn't remember how exactly that went. And it doesn't go well. Mm -mm. (laughs) Joffrey loses his shit. Yeah. Uh, even the little girls, like, what does he mean? Mommy, what's he talking about? Oh, Marcella. <laughs> He's the king, though, right? Like, isn't that how this works? Oh, my God. Sweetie. Uh, I can still see, like, in my head, I can picture uh, Jack Gleason sitting in that chair in the throne with, like, one leg oh propped up over the... <laughs> what a brilliant... Oh God, you hated him yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, just perfect for that role. Perfect in the role. Mm-hmm. So good that he like ne- never wants to do anything ever again. <laughs> I am not mad at him for that. Oh man, I wonder how he's doing these days. <laughs> he's probably like <laughs> gone on to be a veterinarian or something. Oh my God, I would love that. <laughs> um. So. So yeah, yeah and so then Littlefinger, the I did tell you not to trust me. Yeah, you know. well, yeah, and and they because uh, when Ned calls for like arrest them, and it looks like it might be some action, uh, the rest of the guards there just fucking take out his the few men he's got left. Yeah, like they just kill Fat Tom without even giving him a chance to even know it was coming. Yep. Um, and then yeah, Littlefinger pulls out the dagger. That dagger again. mm Hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's how it ends with him. With that, I told you not to trust me. And the thing, too, is that they they produce... No, wait. They kill Tom. They also kill Varley, who I don't remember this person, but his name comes up a couple times. Oh. One of Ned's men, I think. What is it that you're confused on? Uh, Varys is Varys. Is, what does Varys? Varys is here when all this is happening. But I feel like I is he? I skipped. Isn't he? I in don't the think so. When this happened? No, I don't think when, so. When, when, when Ned calls the um, the small council to his room, Peter shows up. Pycelle shows oh, up. Oh, Varys comes Varys. there. Yeah, I thought you meant in the throne room. Oh, I thought they all went to the throne room together, directly from. Ned's. Mm, uh, let me go back. Um, bu- 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 John, da- da- da. I would ask the council to confirm me as Lord Protector. Uh, Fat Tom comes in and tells him you're wanted in the throne room. Um, Littlefinger gave Ned his arm to help him down the steps. Varys, Pycel, and Sir Barrison followed close behind. I guess you're right. They're they're all in there. Yep. You're right. I don't remember anything about like Varus's uh reaction though. I thought that there was a mm-hmm. What are you I just read you the thing. Is that it? He doesn't have any He doesn't say anything? 
while they're having a confrontation with Cersei? Mm, long walk to the far end of the hall. Um, Ned's leg was a blaze of pain. Yeah, no, it's just like him. Okay, Lord Varys, be so kind as to show this to my lady of Lannister. And he just hands her the letter and she tears it up. But Varys doesn't say anything. Oh, sorry. I was just reading uh, after uh, they say the thing about how he's not supposed to really be a king. And she says uh, that uh, the treason is moves from words to deeds. Um, and that's I, that's where I thought Varys piped in. But it's not. She just says the thing about... Um, do you think Sir Barristan stands alone? And that's when uh, everybody comes out and the guardsmen start killing people. Okay. I don't know why I thought Varys had something to say here. I don't know. My mistake. So, okay, yeah, then we go to Arya. And we've already talked about the um, look with your eyes. It's really fun to me to see how much of his lessons she has internalized. Because that is not an easy thing to do. You can take all the lessons you want. But when it comes down to shit, it can be really hard to put those things into action when it counts. And granted, I, there is a moment where she, it says like all of what Sirio taught her fled and she just took John's stick with the pointy end. That's what I was going to bring up. But for a lot of this... She is keeping as clear a head as she can because of what Sirio has taught her. Right. You know? I thought it was a really uh, uh, interesting contradiction because as you were with her and she's terrified and she's trying to escape and she's running kind of through the keep and gets a little turned around. Mm -hmm. She's repeating these things that he said to her as like like mantras. Right. Um, But it's almost like... it's almost like she's not even aware she's doing it. Yeah. And then when she has the uh, thing with the stable boy, mm-hmm. then she has like, she's aware of needing, like hoping to draw on something that Serial has taught her and mm-hmm. realizes that it's all going out the window and all she has is John. Yeah. But, but she has been leaning on all the stuff that Serial taught her, like this whole chapter. And mm-hmm. she, you know, it's almost like she doesn't even realize she was able to do it. Yeah. Um, I just can't get over how self-possessed she is. Uh, and she goes back to her room and like gets a little, a bindle together, like mm-hmm. a little go little bag, go bag. Yep. You know, she finds needle. She, um, there's a great scene where she has to walk like across this courtyard mm-hmm. and she is terrified, but she knows she needs to walk like calmly. Yeah. Like it's no big deal. <laughs> and she, she manages to do it. Uh, the description is something like, even though it felt like there were like bugs crawling all over her. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that. But I, I don't think I could have done it. And she's like eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy too. We kind of skipped over it, but they come to get her mm-hmm. while she's still with Sirio. And Sirio, like the reaction that she has to them saying like your father wants to see you is to instinctively obey. And Sirio has to be like, hold on. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. really weird that he would send Lannisters to ask her to come with you. Why would he do that? And all of a sudden she realizes like, yeah, that actually is a pretty obvious thing. And they very quickly drop the facade of being Mm -hmm. there on her father's behalf. And Sirio fights them. And I had forgotten that he fights them with a fucking fake s- With a sword. wooden sword that has a lead core. I forgot all about that. I love it so much. <laughs> and he takes down like five of them. Yep. Um, God, I wish we had seen more of him. Same. <laughs> it's a, Oh, he's bald. Yeah. Here. I think I used um, some artwork for the episode where he shows up and it was the version of him where he's bald. Yeah. Cause that's mentioned when we first meet him. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, also should mention that the what do we say to the god of death not today is not actually from the books. No, it's not, is it? Nope. Interesting. And I will be the first to admit that I forget that all the time. It's sort of the same as the like, um, you know, happiness can be found even in the darkest of times if only you remember to turn on the light. That quote from Harry Potter that's actually just from the movies and not from the books. Um, uh, but it gets cited by people a lot. It's like one right. of their favorite Harry Potter quotes. And I'm like, does it count as a Harry Potter quote? Like, I guess it does. But for me being the uh, elitist purist that I am, it does not. But also, <laughs> who cares at this point? Um, uh, it's like that Bukowski quote. What's that? Uh, it's, uh, if I'm thinking about the right one, it's, uh, find what you love and let it kill you. Mm. And people always, uh, Photoshop that, but I don't think that that is, it's not really a Charles Bukowski quote, but people attribute it to him all the time. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) whose is it? Or does it? Is it nobody's and somebody just says it's uh I don't know who I don't know who it really is i've I've read it a bunch of times who really said it, and it does not register for me, and uh, I immediately gotcha. forget, <laughs> yeah, there's um, a lot of quotes that are falsely attributed attributed to uh Marilyn Monroe also it's a weird <laughs> one all over the place. I see that shit. Basically, if anybody does that on their Instagram, I unfollow them. Because I'm just like, well, you're obviously down with some shit that I'm not here for this kind of content. So, um, The whole, like, uh, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Which I think people say is her, and I don't think it is. And honestly, oh. like, if you can't handle me at my worst, I can't either. I mean, if you can't handle me at my worst, then you are not alone. <laughs> you know, I mean... It's really one of those things that's meant to be romantic. Like, they'll stand by you no matter what. But, like, the people shouldn't stand by you no matter what. There's a bare minimum of how you should treat people. I don't think it's supposed to be romantic. I think it's supposed to be kind of like, well, you didn't deserve me at all. Well, that's... Kind of. It's like circles back around to romantic. Because you're like, well, if people, like, really committed to each other, then even at your worst, they're by your side. Do you know what I mean? I mean, well, that's like the literal marriage vow, though. <laughs> for that's, better or for worse. No. See, that's different. For better or for worse mm-hmm. is the circumstances that you find Not yourself the in. Not the person being their worst. <laughs> that's a very different thing. Circumstantial, yeah, that sucks mm-hmm. and that's going to happen. And you can cope with that and get through it. But if somebody's just being a piece of shit... And they're like, well, you vowed that no matter what, no, go fuck yourself. Bye-bye. As a person who is habitually at her worst, I plead the fifth. I'm just, (laughs) I have no tolerance, especially since women are the ones that are always like expected to stick it through. Men, it's a a very different standard for what they should be willing to accept in a relationship. Did you see that story that broke on Facebook about the, the police chief that had three or four different families? No. Oh, girl. Where? It's not even it's not even a story story. It was a a Facebook post that went viral. This woman was dating this guy. This is crazy off topic. But uh she's dating this guy and she found out that he was also dating this other woman and then they got together and realized he was married and then they found a fourth woman it was so bad that the police department that he's the chief of took down their facebook page oh my god (laughs) i have to find it and send it to you i have no idea how people do this shit and they think they're not going to get caught how do you think having an affair is just with one person is hard enough. And he was all over the Facebook and they were all like tagging him that they were like in relationships with him. And as far as I could tell, his name was the same on every profile. Jesus Christ. I don't understand it. <laughs> and he wasn't even cute. <laughs> That's what always gets me with fucking dudes like this. 
<laughs> what? Like, that dick must be out of control. And he was an ordained minister. <gasps> <laughs> is this real? I feel like if I'm getting punked. If it's not real, it is one of the most elaborate, like, internet hoaxes that yeah. I've seen in a minute. And it might end up being, but... But yeah, I'll tag you in it so you can see some of that because it's bananas. My God. Um, but anywho, <laughs> that's just always the the thing that I say to like whenever somebody is talking about cheating, you better be ready to get caught because you will, you will, it, it seems will like happen. So much work for so little reward. Listen, this is why I just left. Just be single. And like, you know, it was it was a lot of work. T- t- you could just fuck whoever you want to fuck when you're single. <laughs> it's totally fine. Man, I just, okay. So, okay, back to this. <laughs> Serial fights these guys. Um, Arya watches the fight right up until the last second. Uh, the fourth yeah. sliced his stick in two, splintering the wood and shearing through the lead core, sobbing. Yeah. Arya spun and ran. So. It's to be assumed that he's dead. We don't know what happened to him here. Right. There were a lot of theories going around about uh, seeing him again. Mm. And I know like with the show as well. Uh, I don't remember how the show handled if we do ever see him. How does that? Does that? Is that anything in the show? Mm-mm. From what I recall, it ends very much like the way it's written, where the last thing is we see him fighting that one guy. Is it Trant? Yeah, is that, is that, Trant, is that a real? Yeah, uh, and she runs away, and we don't actually see him go down, but it's not looking good for him. Yeah, um, and I like too that uh, again before the guards show up to to grab her, and they are he's given her the lesson about like believing what you. See, he tells her this story about how he became the first sword of Bravos. Is that yeah. a thing? Yep. And is that a name? Is that a thing? It does. <laughs> that should be the. That should be what this podcast is called. Is that a thing? That would be the that next postcard. Name? Is, is that, that a, a name? Is that a thing? Is that from this? Uh, but he tells her the story about uh, how the king or, or someone had this cat that, uh, you know, was, he would ask people, like, what do they see? And they would be expecting, like, this magnificent creature, this very unique thing. And it's just a regular old tomcat. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a short story, but it just it tickled me so much because... It just feels like that's exactly the kind of person who would have a cat on their lap would do. It just feels right to me. <laughs> I really like because like, like I kind of expected it to be I was the only one who told him the truth, but instead no. it's like people just straight up didn't see, just straight up didn't see what was right there because it was you know, okay yeah it was it was fatter than a regular cat, but that's only because he was really well fed mm-hmm. and you know his ears were like really small and kind of non-existent, but that's because. Uh, you know, he was out in those streets and mm-hmm. sometimes your ears don't make it. And, <laughs> and I think that the king referred to it as a, as a female, but it was clearly just a regular old tomcat. Mm-hmm. And it, I love the idea that, uh, like you said, it's not just about lying to uh, impress the king or tell him what you think he wants to hear, but like this desire and, this, and how easy it is for us to be manipulated Mm -hmm. you know and how um what does he say to her uh something like your eyes god damn it what (laughs) it's uh it's he says you know like uh your eyes see your ears hear you know all that stuff and then he says something like words (sighs) basically People can lie right to your fucking face. Right. But he's, he says it in a much nicer way. <laughs> I'm trying to find the spot so that you don't disappear on me again. Oh, I didn't even bother picking the book up. 
Um, opening your eyes is all that is needing. The heart lies and the head plays tricks with us, but the eyes see true. There Look with it your is. eyes, hear with your ears, taste with your mouth, smell with your nose, feel with your skin. Then comes the thinking afterward. And in that way, knowing the truth. Yes. See? Yes. True. <laughs> um, and she has only been getting lessons. I can't really tell how long they've been in King's Landing at this point. Yeah, it's hard for me to keep that in mind as well. I think it's been a few, like, weeks at this point, but it might be longer. Yeah, I honestly, I feel like maybe like two months, maybe three months. Is that too much? I I don't know. I, I don't really know don't. Either. But, uh, the, but the short amount of time that she got to spend with him uh, just seemed to have such an impact on her. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that a lot of who and what she is is just who and what she is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even if she hadn't had the dancing lessons, I think that she would have been able to... Uh, get up to get her shit from her chest and like have the sense that, like uh where can I go that's safe oh I can't get out of the city because the you know the gates are going to be down and not going to let people in and out I think she would have been able to do all that stuff um but having the lessons from cereal I think just mm, next level next level yeah right like it 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 enabled her to think a little bit more clearly through the steps, mm-hmm. maybe than she would have without it. Um, but I think like all the building blocks for her to to have gotten out of this were already there. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And it really does make you wonder how this would have gone if Ned had not gotten her these lessons. I feel like it would have been ugly. Well, I mean, it's a couple of different questions. Like, they come looking for her there. If she doesn't have these lessons, they just snatch her up from some other place, from some person who's not in a position to protect her. Mm-hmm. Ugh, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which makes me think of um, of Sansa. If they went looking for... Arya, then they would have gone looking for her too. Now, I remember in the show, I know the big points, right? Like, I know what comes next. Mm -hmm. As far as, like, what happens to Ned and Sansa being in King's Landing for a long time after that. Right. But the actual day of all this shit going down, I cannot remember where she is. Mm, And if, like... (sighs) I don't, I'm sorry. I was thinking like, would, I don't know what she's doing with her days. There's no reason for her to have been in the throne room. So she wouldn't have seen all the stuff that went down with Ned. You're talking about Arya here? No, no, I'm not talking about Sansa. Sansa. Okay, yeah, no, no, definitely not. So, I mean, they had to have gone to wherever she spends her days and snatched her up too. Hmm. And whoever she was spending time with wasn't no water dancer. So <laughs> True enough. You know what I mean? So I can't remember exactly how she gets snatched up, but she doesn't get an opportunity to make a run for it. And even if she had an opportunity, Sansa's not running nowhere. No, she's not like that. So, so yeah. It's sort of a weird thing, too, with her because, like, like I said, she is just so much like Ned in choosing to like, she sees things as how they should be instead of how they are. Mm -hmm. And then she even goes a step further than Ned in telling herself a story about what actually happened versus what really happened. Mm -hmm. Because we see how she's already pretending that she like initially, Oh, it all happened so fast. I'm not sure. But then it actually turned into, your butcher's boy attacked Joffrey, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, um, and she's just in a different world in a lot of ways. Yes, she's doing the thing where it's not enough just to let people lie to you. You have to also lie to yourself, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is a real place that some of us live, you yeah. know, uh, for lucky we get to move, but you know, 
Not always. I've really just, I mean, I know how tempting that is, is the other thing that makes me just sort of be like, oh, girl, you know, like we, we all tell ourselves stories. That's just an mm-hmm. unavoidable part of being human. And you have to learn to hold yourself accountable when you're doing it. That's the trick is like figuring out when that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, admittedly, it's really hard to tell. You're like, is that really what's going on here? Or do I just think that's what's going on here? But it, it's so hard because I know how many people like ha- hold Arya or Sansa in contempt for the fact that she starts changing her story. And I definitely s- understand that. And you can't help but to a degree be like, that's despicable, girl. You know, you saw. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And then there's another part of me that's like, she's a child. <laughs> And I know the kinds of stories I told myself as a child. I still tell my stories, myself stories now as a fucking grown up. And as a child, when it's like a definite sort of survival mechanism, how can I even be mad? But Mm. I, and you know, it's just, I don't think that people see it as a survival mechanism when it comes to Sansa because she feels really spoiled and pampered. Mm-hmm. And so it just is sort of like, you know, she's just it's such a easy snot. to dismiss. It's yeah. easy to dismiss her. But I just, I still think that's what it is. And it's interesting that she can be so ignorant and so willing to like buy into these stories. But also there's a part of her that seems to see the truth somehow in there. And it's just, just barely enough that, no, even in my dream, Joff killed that animal. Like, the, she sees enough, but right. it just doesn't break through. It's, hmm, I don't know. Yeah. I think we talked about it uh, a couple episodes ago when we were thinking about, like, say Sansa is more of a realist, which mm-hmm. I don't really even like using the, the idea of, like, uh, Arya is the realist and, and, and Sansa is the, you know, the I, I, idealist. Yeah. That doesn't feel right. But because they're both so young, I don't think that you can be solely either one of those things at, at that age, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all it really, I mean, not to take away their individual personality traits, but a lot of the other stuff, I think, is just that. Um, Sansa is of an age where she has been prepped. We've talked about this a lot, you know, for a very particular type of life in a role. Mm-hmm. And Arya is on her way to that stage, but hasn't gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. And, and still gets away with being kind of, um, blah, kind of, a. I wanted to say surly, but that's not right. But kind of, you know, isn't it? If you, <laughs> you know, she gets the gets away with still being kind of wild and like breaking the rules because she hasn't really come of age yet, where somebody has sat her down and said, "This is what you must be like now." Mm-hmm. You know, um, if all things were good and right in the world, and they never left Winterfell, would Arya have grown into the type of woman that is obsessed with clothes and boys? Probably not. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Would she have eventually probably uh, conceded that this is kind of her role in her life? I think she would have. Hmm. Because I'm not sure that her desire to be... You know, to have this life of adventure and everything would have been strong enough for her to disobey her parents in a perfect world where mom and dad are still at Winterfell and, you know, the the world isn't trying to murder all the Starks. Hmm. You know, because what are her options? She just leaves Winterfell. She doesn't marry. She leaves Winterfell and goes off on her own. Yeah. I don't I don't know if I believe that, that she would have made that choice because that would have meant disappointing her parents in a in a profound way. You know. I wonder if it would. 
Might have what, disappointed, disappointed her mom. I don't know if Ned would be. Well, that's the thing, though, because we were just talking about uh, how, I mean, how much Ned sticks to these these sort of rules of how things are supposed to go. You know, I mean, like, it's one thing for him to kind of chuckle to himself that, oh, you know, Arya's got a little needle, you know, and that's very cute. And I guess I can let her take these little dancing classes. And it's another thing to have, like, a 16-year-old daughter who you need to marry off to so-and-so's house. And Mm -hmm. her just being like, fuck you, yeah, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Like, that's not going to go over well for him. I'm in, yeah, I'm not sure that I agree. Like, I, yeah. I totally understand the principle behind what you're saying. But I feel like Ari is much more subscribed to that uh, school of thought that's like, yeah, the norms don't matter. I am going to leave. So mm. you can either lock me in my bedroom like it's a dungeon and treat me like a prisoner literally every day, which I don't think you'd love, Dad or Mom. Or... You can give me your blessing and I will go do what I am going to do because I want to. And what other alternative is there? And I feel like she would call their bluff a little bit, you know? I I mean, like we, like, I mean, it's funny because after having watched the show for so long and seeing her like kind of grow up, Mm -hmm. you know, it's almost impossible to imagine her being anything other than what she became. But... Like, even when the guards come to get her from Cereals, her first instinct is to obey. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, but um, she's a kid. That's yeah. just, like, that's something that's built into a lot of kids. Respect for authority. You know? I don't feel like that's an indicator of anything. No, no. I do. I, th- I feel like it... I think that her... I think that maybe we underestimate her desire to, like, make her family proud, to not bring shame on her family. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's impossible to know because shit did go terrible. (laughs) The world did want to kill all the stars. Um, But, yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I feel like not wanting to disappoint your family or bring shame on your house, that's one thing in concept, but you're going to assess what would do that in very different ways. So I feel like somebody like Aria, like she gets married and that person thinks that they're just getting a regular wife and then they get Aria, who... We don't know what kind of wife she would make, but let's pretend that it's the Arya we have now being told that she has to be a wife. That could also feel like you're bringing shame upon your family. Like you're not hold because you're just being fighting tooth and nail the entire time. I don't like this guy. He's not even good looking. What are you doing? Well, I don't want to have kids either. Like, I, I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that that could look or be seen by her or her family. The only thing that gives me an inkling that Arya might be willing to go against everything that's expected of her is the fact that Ned says that she reminds him of Leanna. Mm-hmm. And there's somebody who just went off and did just the worst thing that you probably could do. Which mm-hmm. is like a run off to be with some other man when you've been promised, you know, yeah, to this other family. Um, so when it, when I think about that, that makes me think, oh, maybe Arya would. I feel like maybe if any would, house is going to yeah. like let her do that, it's the Starks. Well, that's the thing, though. I'm not sure about the letting. See, I'm, I think maybe I'm getting too overlap with. What I believe the Starks would let her do and what I believe she's going to fucking go do because she wants to do it. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, but it's fun to think about, you know. Man. Um, yeah. I just, it's not, it, this is hard to read in ways, you know. It's just knowing what's coming. Mm-hmm. And this is so inevitable. When you've read the book already, there's just, there's no... 
you just want every time for people to make different decisions <laughs> and to put their trust in different people. And it is so hard to see them get let down, get played, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and also like them feel like fools or blame themselves. I mean, it's just there's a ugh, it's just rough, man. I have been dreading getting to parts of this series like this, where things finally really begin to go wrong. Because I know that I'm going to be screaming at the book, like, not yeah, this time. Yeah, yeah. No, don't do that this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's we literally that why I'm here, because they do that. <laughs> we, you did it last time, and it didn't work out for you. You know? Yeah, I get that. It's hard. Um, anyway, so... We didn't really talk about like her sojourn through everything bit by bit, but really what it comes down to is she figures out pretty quickly that it's Stark's bodies that she's seen mm-hmm. all over the mm-hmm. place. Like they're mm-hmm. all from her, from Winterfell. And um, she does that thing where she has to cross that open area and try and act cool. I like that we have been taught about how like the prince and princess ran into her when she was hunting cats and didn't even recognize her. Mm -hmm. So we know that there is a possibility that she looks like such a mess that nobody's going to realize who she is. So that's nicely established. (laughs) Um, And she has the forethought. She's like, she goes into the stable. That boy is like, sweet. I'm going to bring you to Cersei and she'll reward me. What? I was just the, the, the fucking narration. The, the, this fucking oh kid. <laughs> what did he say? Then I, then I read it. I listened to it earlier in the day, and then I read the chapters a little bit before we were started recording. And I was like, "Oh, it's actually just written like this." Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's written. It, it's almost. I think the implication is that the kid is like a little slow. Oh, I didn't get that at all. Like I he's, thought he was just supposed to be very low, like you know, small folk, like very very small folk. The way that he like looks at the the sword, I hesitate to even call it that, but yeah, a sword yeah. stuck in his chest and he just says, Oh gods, take it out. Something about that is so pathetic. Mm. Oh God. When she took it out, he died. <laughs> oh, okay. We're just gonna write it like that. Um So yeah, she kills him because she got discovered, but also she's trying to get a horse. And then after he's dead and she's about to fucking saddle up, she stops and is like, oh, my God, they're most definitely going to have the gates closed. I'm not going to be able Mm -hmm. to just ride out of here. Like, unless up close they don't recognize me, but they probably will. I don't want to even risk going that way. And uh, so she decides that she's going to have to find another way out and remembers the room with all the monsters in it. And decides that she's going to have to, like, try and find her way there. And she gets lost initially. Um, and I'm trying to find the spot here to make sure that I end at the right place. So, boop, boop, boop. Um, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. I love this. So, uh, the part where she is at the stable, I forgot to mention this, but... She had to leave now, she told herself, but when the moment came, she was too frightened to move. Calm as still water, a small voice whispered in her ear. Arya was so startled, she almost dropped her bundle. She looked around wildly, but there was no one in the stable but her, and the horses, and the dead men. Quiet as a shadow, she heard. Was it her own voice, or Sirio's? She could not tell, yet somehow it calmed her fears. What do you think of that? Because this feels distinctly different than her reciting a mantra to herself under her breath. She really has a reaction like she heard an actual voice in the air. Um, I don't know what to make of it. Okay. Because there's no, as far as I can think of, there's no, like, reasonable explanation for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. 
we're not supposed to believe there's anything supernatural going on with Serio, as far as I thought. So, yeah, I don't know. All right. I just wanted to mention it because uh, I had forgotten about this little bit here. Um, so, yeah, she kills the guy. She goes to the sept and she steals some candles and then goes down into the catacombs. And she starts thinking about when she was little she went down to the uh, tombs in Winterfell with <laughs> Sansa and Rob, and I think that maybe Bran was there. I don't mm-hmm. know if Tommen was there. I don't think so. But uh, there's Brooklyn. this like terrible noise, and then the spirit appears, and she, everybody else like freaks out and begins to run, and she steps forward. And punches the spirit, and it turns out that it's John covered in flour, which is fantastic. That is a hundred percent something an older brother would do. Definitely, that's some shit I would do now. I would absolutely <laughs> do that right now. Except that it would ruin my hair. Flour, get out of here. Say it, you would be such a mess. Oh my god, I'm just thinking like you would want to be like I'll just jump in the shower, but then you just got paste. Oh my hand. god! You got that like glue that you would make out of flour and water as a kid. Ugh. Um. The memory made Arya smile, and after that, the darkness held no more terrors for her. The stable boy was dead. She'd killed him, and if he jumped out at her, she'd kill him she'd again. Kill him again. I oh, love so it good. so much. So good. And this time, like I don't remember, but. She realizes that the where she is now is their dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs, dragons. Good lord, you guys. Ma'am. Bitch is tired. <laughs> uh, did she realize they were dragons the first time she was down there? I can't remember. Uh, I'm not sure if she, I, I feel like she didn't call them that in her head, but she figured it out. Right, okay. But I'm not positive. Or maybe it's like talking to her dad, he told her. I don't remember. I don't know if it's, uh, I just completely made it up. It's very likely that I did. But something about her saying it by name Mm -hmm. instead of like calling it like just the monsters feels, I don't know, significant. Like an understanding. seeing with her eyes. Kind of, yeah. You know, And, and also like a little, this is a huge leap, but something about it feels empowering. Like, we know that she loves dragons and stories and knows about all that, you know, the history of them and all that. And the moment realizing that this thing that you were afraid of because you didn't know what it was turns out to actually be a thing that you love and have always been curious about and love to read about, Mm -hmm. you know, has a real kind of, you know turning your nightmares into something good kind of energy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, but I, I definitely could, get that. Yeah. All right. So that's the end of that chapter. Um, so again, guys, we're just going to be doing two um, for the next foreseeable future. We may drop down to one eventually. Who knows what could happen? But before we wrap up, I just really quickly, I have a shorter list of names this week because I have caught up finally. <laughs> So, um, this past week we have Chonita 2006, Cindy Schmitz, Jawan Jones, Jackie Nemeth, Brain Case, Majo Na, Majo Na. When it's G N A, the G is just silent, right? I I don't know how to answer that. Oh, I think it's just (laughs) so Majo Na, Um, Broderick, Matt, Aaron Schwartz, Rowan, Francis De Brunner. Julian Classic, and Alicia Nelson. Welcome to all of you delightful people. We are very happy to have you. Make sure if you are a $5 and up patron to check out Miss Born, which I'm covering with Miles. Rashawn and I just did it on Sober about Facebook. Uh, and we are going to be covering the movie Ghost for the next one, which is going to be the day before Valentine's Day. Because uh, I haven't seen it, and Rashawn thinks I should watch it. So... It's It's got something to do with Dresden Files. I won't get into it, but there's a reason why it came up. It's not just a random thing. And um, 
I keep thinking that there's, I have like another small announcement. I think I'm just going to mention that, uh, Owen and I are pretty sure we're going to cover Clone Wars after we're done with Legend of Korra. So if y'all are interested in supporting that, um, keep an eye on the feeds and also you will be able to just go to the website and, uh, purchase episodes there. They're going to be a buck each They're for the fundraiser for our wedding. And we appreciate all of your support and feedback on those. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. So thank you all again for listening. I'm really glad that we didn't have any technical issues this week. Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. I, should I have can't even believe said you it. just said that. And we'll see you next week with two more <laughs> chapters. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Bye, guys. Joffrey. Cersei. Walter Frey. That was an unspoiled network podcast.